The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, April 24th, 2016. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a pre recorded e Bible Fellowship's questions and answers time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre recorded questions and answers time and say hello to Chris McCann. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone, to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Question and Answer Program. During this time, we're going to open up the room uh, to all to receive your questions or your comments or welcome uh, during this time. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible, as the Bible is God's holy word. And it is in the Bible that we have comfort and assurance of truth. And and so the Bible is, without any question, the place we want to be turning when we we see the circumstances and the situation of the church all around us and of the world that has always been uh, in, in darkness and deceived. It's only the Bible that we can find answers to spiritual questions. It's only in the Bible that God speaks to us and and also the Holy Spirit guides us into truth. And so we want to spend our time, and that's the reason for this program, in looking into the things of God and bringing up various scripture and considering these things because it is the best use of our time possible and especially on Sunday the Lord's Day. This day is not like any other day of the week. It is God's holy day, a day he has set apart for the good and benefit of his people. And when we delight ourselves in it, then we will find that there is great blessing and great help to us in our lives as um, it, it will be a source of strength for us to draw upon throughout the, the week that follows Sunday after Sunday as we uh, spend hours in the Bible or in prayer or in spiritual activities. It, it is really the best thing we could do, especially as things are, are falling apart. There is uh, spiritual, moral chaos all around us, and and the Bible is our strength. It is our help. It is uh, our anchor of our soul as we turn to it again and again. Well, we're we're going to begin now by going to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon. Question and answer program, please. Go ahead with your call. I'd like to compare two verses together. And then after that, I'd like to talk about the uh, voice of an archangel. The first verse is Luke 16, verse 22. Luke 16, 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. Okay. Now notice in this verse it said the dead person was carried away by the angels. Now look at First Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here Christ himself picks up the dead and brings them into heaven. Why is it that in this case the angels are picking up the dead and here the Lord himself is picking up the dead? 
Well, the the parable in Luke 16 is pretty difficult to understand. We we do know it's teaching us about the nature of hell or being in the grave. As the rich man in hell, God is is showing us some of the aspects of what it means to be in hell or in the grave. And when when we look at it, we find that um, the, the rich man, in verse 23, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and, and, and then it goes on that, that this is really an account of God bringing judgment wherein the rich man can no longer become saved. He desires salvation. He he desires that Lazarus bring a drop of water to him, just a drop, the, the littlest amount possible. And yet God has placed a great gulf between Lazarus and the rich man. And there there is no crossing over there there's no way for Lazarus the beggar who represents the elect of God to bring the word of God carrying the message of salvation so to deliver the rich man from his torment and and that's really what this is focused on it, it's teaching us about the spiritual horrible spiritual judgment that has come upon the unsaved people of the world, it, a great gulf has been established when God shut the door of heaven and ended his salvation program. And, and, and so on one hand, you have Lazarus, who is lifted up into Abraham's bosom. And, and remember what Jesus said to... Nathaniel, I think it was, in John 1, it says, um, verse 51, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so their angels are ascending. Messengers of God are ascending. And that happens in salvation all through history spiritually when god would save someone they would ascend in a figure into the heavens to be seated in christ jesus or abraham's bosom and then god throughout the history of the world or most of it was still evangelizing people and so he he sent them back as it were uh, instantaneously to be messengers of the gospel. And and yet in Luke 16, it's describing Judgment Day. And so um, Lazarus ascends, but he's not sent. That's the point of the parable. The, the rich man desires Lazarus to be sent uh, back to earth as has been the case throughout all history. But no, no, uh, the, with his discussion with Abraham, who's a type of God himself, there is no more sending of the messenger, the angel, back to earth because it it's over and done with. Everything is settled now as far as that's concerned. Well, all right, um... I was just noticing, though, that it, it says here that Lazarus died, okay? And, see, one one body, soul gets picked up by the angels, and the other one is left. But, um, and then, in, in when Jesus, is, when what you call the rapture, notice that Christ himself is removing the, the person into heaven. He says, so I was just wondering, like, it, like, like, it seems like it was originally the job of angels to deliver somebody into heaven when they literally go to heaven. And in here, Christ is bringing up the dead into heaven. 
I was just wondering why it one spot it says angels, the other spot it says the Lord Himself. Well, uh, you know, the, uh, again, um, it's a parable, and so yes, Lazarus uh, died, and then he went into Abraham's bosom, but but remember, God says in Romans chapter six. In verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Or verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. So salvation, according to the Bible, is a form of death. Uh, Remember, what it says in Revelation 20, after seeing the souls of them under the altar, or or the, the actually this group in Revelation 20 isn't said to be under the altar, but it mentions the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, God's elect. Then it says in verse 5, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. A- again, a reference to the great multitude, the elect that will become saved during the little season of the great tribulation, and God calls them the rest of the dead. Or in Revelation 9, part of the torment of the five months, in verse 6, and in those days shall men see death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. It's not physical death, but it's spiritual death through baptism with Christ. We're baptized into his death. We uh, Salvation is identification with the death of Christ. So, um, you know, when, when Jesus is clearly speaking a parable, uh, we have to look at everything in the parable to, to see well, um, okay, what does this mean? What does this represent? And even death uh, it, in the Bible has a parabolic meaning. Okay, now the second thing I wanted to talk about is, I, I, I'm not saying I'm right about this, but this is something that was revealed to me, uh, something I noticed in the Scriptures. I would like to talk about the voice of an archangel, is that throughout the Bible, Whenever a heavenly being approached somebody on the earth, whether it is through vision or some sort of contact, that the individual themselves heard words, but other people in the room or the neighbors didn't hear no words. And that in uh, 1 Thessalonians, it says that Christ returns the voice of an archangel. It seems that the voice of an archangel is something similar to telepathy where the communication is mind to mind and then like you also have something called the tongues of angels which is like the same thing as uh, either communication between people through telepathy where the other people don't hear any voices going on it's a uh, non the other people in the room like the prophet Paul said there was three he was with two men and they only saw a light, and he he was the only one that heard words speaking to him. I mean, the voice of an archangel seems to be a telepathic communication between an individual and a, a spirit being. Um, and I just want to see if you agree with that. No, no. When, as we read in First Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The word ark means chief, and the word angel means messenger. So Jesus is descending from heaven with the voice of the chief messenger. He, he is the messenger of the covenant. He is the word and and so the what is the voice of the lord jesus christ and and the voice is the word of god the bible it it is the word itself uh remember you know god 
makes all kinds of statements about his word. Um, For instance, in Revelation 1, it says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and, and so forth. And, and so God, you see, when God makes these kinds of statements, what he's doing is drawing comparisons or making identifications with certain words. Uh, that is, in Revelation 1.10, the word of Christ, that great voice, is tied to or linked to a trumpet. And, and and so then in other parts of the Bible, when we read about a trumpet, we have to think, because God has made this kind of connection in Revelation 1.10, that the trumpet is the word of Christ or the word of God, the Bible. And, and that's why, for instance, in Ezekiel uh, 33, when the watchman sees the sword coming, and, and the sword, again, we have a link in another part of the Bible, in Hebrews, where God says the word is like a two-edged sword, his word. And, and, and so we carry that link, that identification between sword and the word, into Ezekiel 33, when the watchman sees the sword coming, that is the judgment of God coming on the pages of the Bible, he blows the trumpet to warn the people. And what's the trumpet? According to Revelation 1.10, the trumpet identifies with the great voice, the voice of Christ, and Christ is the word. So again, when you see in the, in the Bible, the judgment of God is approaching and and, and that is when God opened the scriptures to reveal time and judgment, then the believers blow the trumpet or share the news, share the word of God in, on, in tracks or through discussion. You, you see, that's how God wrote the Bible, making these types of identifications with certain words and certain, certain truths. And and then with the true believers, he gives them ears to hear. That is, they, they come to understand, oh, uh, you know, we're, we're developing a vocabulary. We're developing a spiritual vocabulary that helps us with our definitions. You know, just like you learn English or any language, you learn words, then you have to learn what the words mean. And then when you hear the words, when someone's speaking those words, you understand what they're saying. Well, likewise, with the Bible, you see how God makes these spiritual definitions or, or links from one particular truth to a word. And then as you're reading the Bible elsewhere, you see trumpet or sword or and and you draw upon that link, and then you're now equipped to define spiritually what's going on in that verse. And and so with First Thessalonians four sixteen, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the word of God. This is the glorious. Word of God and with the trump of God. It's re-emphasizing the same thing. What is the trump? I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. It it's just um doubling it and and restating the same truth. The voice of the archangel is the trump of God. It is God's holy word, the Bible, that is in view with these statements. Can I give you just one last reference to what I'm saying? I don't know where it is in Genesis, but at the Tower of Babel, it said the whole world was of one speech and one thought, as if they can communicate through thought 
a single language everybody understood. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about before the Bible is complete. Well, well, hold it. It says in Genesis 11, verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. It doesn't say thought. One one of those words can be translated thought, according to the uh, Strong's Concordance. Well, yeah, but it wasn't, because... That, and yeah. and even if it did say thought, and, and or or if that word could be translated that way, well, yeah, it would just be implying that man is unified in his rebellion against God. That that we uh, unsaved individuals all have a desperately wicked heart alike, but but it doesn't mean anybody can perceive anybody else's thoughts. Jesus knew what people were thinking because he's eternal God, and God searches the heart. He he knows everything that's within a person, even in their uh, subconscious mind that they themselves do not know. But but uh, you you find some people who claim to be mind readers, but they're it's it's a trick. Maybe uh, on occasion Satan in uh, that little ability that God gave him, you know, he, he can do uh, what's slightly above the level of a cheap magic trick from time to time in the area of breaking the supernatural, but he, he can't read people's minds. He, he doesn't know, like God knows, what's going on in the hearts of men. No, that that is not so. But thank you for calling and sharing, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. McCann. Um, could you please read Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 5 through 7, and then I'd like to ask a question. Ezekiel chapter 7, beginning in verse 5, it says, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, in evil and only evil, behold, is come. An end is come, the end is come. It watches for thee, behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Okay, my understanding of this passage is that Ezekiel was to warn the Israelites to repent, and if they would not, they would reach the, this day, uh, which was mentioned in the verses. They would reach that day, uh, that morning, a very specific date and time when their repentance or salvation would no longer be possible. And I think we understand that to have been May 21st, 2011. Now, can you please read Isaiah 14? verses 10 to 12, then I'd like to ask a question. Isaiah 14, verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Okay. When Lucifer is called son of the morning, does that statement relate to the content of the morning spoken about in Ezekiel? Well, uh, for, for some reason, I have a little difficulty keeping in my mind exactly um this statement here in Isaiah 14:12 I I think even in a Genesis Bible study I I misspoke about it so I want to be careful um let me take a look at the interlinear in Isaiah 14 verse 12 um well we we know that Satan is in view here but I I at this point don't feel comfortable it, you know, there's a couple of verses in the Bible for, well, probably more than that, for whatever reason, I just have to continually remind myself and remind myself. And and uh, right now, um, 
I, I just don't have it uh, clearly in mind. So I'd, I'd rather not comment on this verse. But what, what are you asking again? What is your question? Well, in Ezekiel, uh, the word there, mourning, is translated as uh, diadem or, or crown, I believe. I didn't look at it this morning. Um, and I think that's pretty particular to the day of judgment where God is fairly victorious. Um, but I think that relates to May 21st in Ezekiel, uh, as, as well as the content before Ori's warning to the Israelites. It's very final. And I was just curious if that morning um, and the content in Isaiah would relate, and perhaps we can see some Oh, uh, oh okay. I, I checked another Bible now. where I have um, some notes. And actually, this son of the morning, um, morning is 7837 in the concordance. And it relates because of how it's used in, in some passages where the morning appears and, and it's related to judgment or destruction. And and so when when he is called, um, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? It it actually is the equivalent to son of perdition in Second Thessalonians chapter two, the the man of sin, the son of perdition, because perdition means destruction, and the way God uses mourning when we search it out. It leads to a few places where judgment or destruction is in view. And, and so that's the tie-in with that particular word, mourning. It, it is speaking of Satan in Second Thessalonians 2. Uh, he is the, the man of sin that takes his seat in the temple. And he's also called the son of perdition there. And, and perdition, again, means destruction. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for calling and sharing, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. In Jonah chapter 3, 1 through 4, God said in verse 3, Nineveh was three days' journey. But in verse 4, God said that Jonah entered Nineveh in a day's journey. So I was wondering, is God teaching that it took Jonah one day to enter Nineveh instead of three? Uh, yes. Um, so let me read the verses you're referring to. In okay. Jonah 3, beginning in verse 1, And the word of Jehovah came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of Jehovah. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, um, someone on um, eBible's Facebook question and answer group uh, a few weeks back, they made a point that I think is correct. And that is Nineveh, which is a picture of the world, is said to be three days' journey. But uh, when God sends Jonah, and the name Jonah means dove, and a dove in the Bible and in each of the gospel accounts represents the Holy Spirit. So this is the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's in view. It would relate to the latter rain period. And God commands... The Holy Spirit, he sends the Spirit into the world, of course, carried by the body of believers as the Word of God was proclaimed to the nations of the world. But the point that's being made here is that Nineveh is a great city of three days' journey. To reach all of Nineveh, you must travel three days. It's so large a city. But Jonah goes into the city a single day's journey and issues the proclamation that he was told to issue, yet 40 days, it's a timeline, 
It's a timeline with an end day. You could circle the calendar. Yet 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed. And then as far as the account goes, that's all that he did. Jonah did not go a second day, and he did not go a third day into the city. He only went one day's journey, and then apparently he went outside the city. He um, made himself a booth or a tabernacle and sat under it to see what would become of the city, and he waited for the rest of the time, 39 days. Uh, obviously, he waited until the 40-day period would expire. And and so we wonder, why does God tell us this? Is this just further um, evidence that is indicating that Jonah was rebellious about the whole thing, or his heart wasn't in it, that he only did the least possible amount of work in sharing the Word of God as he could just by going a day's journey? No, we have to remember that all of these historical events were controlled by God, and God wanted Jonah only to enter in a single day's journey And that's because it's really picturing or representing the command of Christ to go into all the world. Remember in Matthew 28, in Matthew 28, it says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That is the command that is known as the Great Commission. It, it's what the church has referred to for many centuries. And the command has traditionally been taught that the gospel was to go into every nation of the world and to reach all the people of the earth. And that's not correct. That's not correct. That is not what's in view with the Great Commission. The actual command of the Lord Jesus Christ, if if it were to reach all the earthly nations and all the inhabitants of the earthly nations, we would have to say it was a miserable failure. It was uh, just just a, a complete failure because all the nations were not reached. Some were not reached until the 20th century. That means for 1,900 years they were not reached, and others still yet have been reached. All the inhabitants of the earth throughout the last 2,000 years have not been reached. And if they were they they the command was baptized all nations you're you're to teach all nations baptizing them not a remnant from all nations not a portion of all nations you are to baptize and teach all nations in the baptize in the name of the father son and holy ghost well how many of the nations of the world were taught and baptized? A very, very small number. And again, a miserable failure if it's referring to the physical nations and and all the earthly people that inhabit them. But it's not. It's not. In Revelation and Really, this is an eye-opening verse. In Revelation 21, it says in verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations, and that's the same word. It's the word Gentile, the same word in Matthew 28. And the nations of them 
which are saved shall walk in the light of it. That's speaking of the new heaven and the new earth. The nations of them which are saved compared to Luke chapter 12 in verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. So when we find the word nations, it could be nations of the world or nations of them which are saved. And obviously, there's no question about it. Obviously, in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, he's referring to the nations of them which are saved, baptizing them, all the elect, all that will become saved, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And and then we have harmony. We, we see the gospel was not a miserable failure. It was an astounding success. All the nations of them which are saved were taught. All were baptized by the Spirit of God into the triune God. And, and that is the Great Commission. Now, it, it does work out. It turns out that when during the, the church age and during the little season of Great Tribulation, during the two periods of reign in which the nations of them which are saved were saved in the New Testament era, there's no way of knowing who they are or where they are. So the gospel had to go far and wide into the nations to large numbers of the people of the earth. They had to hear because we didn't know who were these nations of God's elect, the nations of them which were to be saved. It does work out that way. But that's a secondary concern. The original command is not to reach all physical nations and all physical people. And in Jonah chapter 3, God is making that point. The city, Nineveh, representing the world, is three days' journey. Jonah goes in one day's journey, and then there is that enormous response, that wonderful reaction of repentance from the king on down, because it's as though he has reached all of the elect, and, and you can break up the three days it would take to travel through the city in one-third, two-third relationship. One-third of the city was reached, two-thirds went unreached, because two-thirds, which written as a decimal is, is 0.666, the number of man, are not the, the elective God, they are the nations of the world, but the nations of them which are saved, one-third that God brings through the fire. They were reached. And so we can relate this to the worldwide outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the days leading up to May 21, 2011, when the message of the Bible went far and wide and billions of people heard, but not necessarily every human being in every nation. That is not necessary nor required but it was required that all the nations of them which are saved hear that message, and they did. And once they did, God can bring the evangelization of the earth to a close because the gospel has never been designed for those that are not predestinated to salvation. God has never sent the gospel into the world to reach unsaved men. It has never been the purpose. It was never part of the Great Commission. It has always been, uh, as Jesus, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and for none other. It has always been designed to find and locate the lost sheep 
God's elect. And once the last sheep is brought in, God can rightly, justly, properly close his salvation program, and there is no fault, there, there is no wrong he has done, because it was never intended to be sent forth in order to um, make man feel uh, that that God cared about him or 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 to have some sort of safety net for the wicked of the world. No, the gospel had a, a very definite purpose to save the elect. And once that was accomplished, then, okay, the, the, now God can stop sending forth the gospel. There's, there's just no more to be baptized or taught. And, and remember, uh, I forget, uh, it's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament that God does say they shall be all have have been taught of the Lord, or it might even be Isaiah, and 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 so the statement in that verse I, I I can't remember it exactly indicates that the Great Commission was fulfilled because all had been taught. But thank you for calling and sharing, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, good afternoon, Brother Chris. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned about, I heard you mentioned about Jonah being the the dove, uh, the meaning dove, and um, means the Holy Spirit. Yes. So uh, my my question is, even before Christ came, Jehovah, Jehovah God would have to save each elect, before Christ, in the Old Testament, he would have to save each one of them before they died, uh, after they were born on, uh, to this earth. So the Holy Spirit was already, uh, would have to apply salvation way back, right? So, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, so that means the three of them, and to always work together, right? Well, yes, yes. We re- remember what David says in Psalm 51. After he was convicted of his sins, as God sent Nathan the prophet to him concerning mm-hmm. adultery and murder, and and he's fearful. David is is being moved by God to record this psalm, but still it 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 does reveal his mindset he he sees what he has done and yes. and so he is uh crying out uh to god he he's saying let's see in psalm 51 in verse 9 hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities create in me a clean heart o god and renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. There, it's the same exact thing that a true believer today would be concerned with. If we had committed sin, and we looked at ourselves and we said, well, how could I, a child of God, be involved with that? I, it, it, It's evidence that I'm not saved. Oh, oh Lord, uh, dear Father, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So when David or Abel or Noah or any of the Old Testament saints became saved, they received the Holy Spirit, just just like anyone in the New Testament. What happened on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33 after Christ had gone to the cross, was now what had been pretty much limited to the nation of Israel uh, concerning God's salvation, because they were the caretakers of the oracles of God, and pretty much limited to individuals that had some dealings with, with Israel, like Rahab the harlot, or Ruth the Moabitess, or Naaman the Syrian, or people like that, very, very few people, because Israel was a small nation, and and they had uh, limited contact with 
a few nations around them, and, and those nations had their other gods. What, what God changed, the program that he changed, was now to send forth the word, the gospel of salvation into all the world to find the nations of them which are saved. And in order to do that, the church age was established and churches began to spring up in the various countries and nations all over the earth. And more and more people heard the Bible that never heard it before. People in Africa or people in Asia, people eventually on on uh, South Pacific Islands and and people, Indian tribes in North America or the tribes in South America and so forth, all over the world, the Holy Spirit was poured out now. It was an official pouring out of the gospel or the Holy Spirit that had never been done before. Uh, I guess the only thing in the Old Testament that would even come close was Jonah being sent to Nineveh. And and that was a very limited experience because it was just one city. It was a large city, but it was only one city. And the just think of all the many cities that uh, that lived for or existed that sprung up over eleven thousand years of Old Testament history, and God never sent a Jonah. He never sent one of His prophets into those cities. But the difference with the New Testament is now go into the nations that that is go out in the world and find the nations of them which are to be saved, and and so the the gospel went forth. Okay, another uh, quick comment is um, about Cain and Abel. If I look at the Genesis three twenty one, Genesis eight twenty, uh, Genesis chapter four. And Luke 15:29, my conclusion is um, Abel, when he offered his sacrifice, I believe that he was out uh, doing it out of true thanksgiving. And also Noah, when he landed uh, on, on the land after the flood, I believe he was doing it out of thanksgiving. But Cain and the prodigal sons, brother, the older brother, I don't think um, they experienced salvation or God's mercy. So they might be, say, for example, the oldest son said, you know, he's with, always been with his dad, That, but how come the dad never uh, gave him, a, you know, the kid? Yeah. So well, it's like he never experienced mercy because he, he was always with him, so he did not need mercy. And not only that, he's not doing out of thanksgiving. Maybe he thought if he stayed with his dad, he would be blessed. Like people wanted to be blessed by going to church. They want to be blessed by reading the Bible. So it's like bribing God. And so maybe uh, this eldest son and Cain have the same kind of heart, you know, so because otherwise they wouldn't have been jealous, you know? Well, so they, they right, pre- right. <laughs> but, um, you know, to say that Cain did not offer out of thanksgiving, we have to keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of unsaved people that have perhaps maybe a more positive type mindset who are quick to praise God and and thank God with their mouth, uh, whereas you, you could have a true believer, an elect, who, who doesn't behave that way. And, and, and maybe even has more of a negative mind uh, the way they think because of how they were brought up or for whatever reason. But uh, see, that's why it's important to keep the focus on the heart, on salvation, and not on... It, it has nothing to do with what was offered or really the manner in which it was offered. For all we know, Abel could have woken up that day and and just been in a miserable mindset you know woken up on the wrong side of the bed he he could have been feeling as ungrateful as anything and and yet 
uh, okay, God wants me to do this, and, and for whatever reason, he went through the motions and he offered it, and God accepted Abel and his offering. And on the other hand, maybe maybe Cain, uh, who put much more effort and time into the offering, was excited and and maybe he did think, well, this is wonderful, and and maybe he's saying praise God and, and looking forward to it. And then God does not accept Cain nor his offering. It's not. See, this is the what God does in the Bible. God does this often in the Bible. He will tell us of an event. And, and like, for instance, um, as he does in James with um, Abraham, he says in James 2, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And our minds go to the magnificent work that God's referring to that Abraham did of offering up his son, his only son, Isaac, and being ready to plunge the knife into him and to kill his only son because God told him to do it. And we say, yes, Abraham was justified by that work. And and in reality, that work had nothing to do with his justification. It had nothing to do if he did a thousand works like that. It could never justify him because the Bible says a man is not justified by the works of the law and any obedient or attempted act of obedience to the command of God is a work of the law no God is saying was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac meaning was he not already saved by the work and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ paid for his sins from the foundation of the world And it was applied to him at that time when he offered his son Isaac. And, uh, you know, I've used this example before. If uh, God uh, uh, chose to select another moment in Abraham's life, let's say he he was um, taking out the trash, And he could say, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he took out the trash that morning? And we all say, the reader thinks, what kind of of wonderful spiritual act is it to take out the trash? There's nothing that could justify him in that action. And that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point why God picks something glorious and and that's how he hides the truth that if you look at abraham plunging the knife into his son well we're we're just enamored and 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 we're mesmerized by all that but if but if he would say taking out the trash we immediately understand well he could not have been justified by that action oh it must be he's justified by the work of Christ when he took out the trash because he's a saved man at that point in time. And and that's how it is with Cain and Abel. It's as simple as that. At the time of the offering, God accepted Abel and his offering. It could have been anything that Abel offered. Because Abel was saved by the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God rejected Cain and or did not accept Cain and his offering for the opposite reason. He was not saved by the work and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the person of Cain is rejected. The the attempt, the work, whatever it was, it wouldn't matter was rejected with whatever mindset he brought it. If he was thankful and and thinking positive about God, it wouldn't matter. God would have rejected it just the same. But thank you for calling and sharing.
And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, I was calling about that. I think it was the first caller back in Isaiah 14. Um, but when I called in, I think you had uh, looked in your Bible, other Bible, and got what I was going to say. Um, but I, it, I think um, also... I have some notes from what Mr. Camping was teaching about this passage. And in um, Isaiah 14, verse 12, he was saying that Lucifer was was not a real good translation, that it should be boaster or boaster of, boaster, son of destruction. Yeah, yeah. They, um, I don't know if I have notes for that. that that's where I've um, tended to error a couple of times and misspeak is by um, something about the verse is not sticking with me too well. But, but yeah, I think that's correct that it's uh, something that means glorying or boasting or uh, the word translated as Lucifer. It it relates to glorying. And, and also um, one of the verses that morning points of destruction is Genesis 1915. Yeah, thank you. In Genesis 19, this same word, morning, is found in verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened, Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest they'll be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And that's the morning that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah would be destroyed. So it relates to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it, it, it's, I think, found in a couple of other places, too, in uh, passages that, that tie in with destruction. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. So I haven't called in for, for quite some time. I just wanted to um, also... Uh, bring up that verse in Isaiah uh, 14, uh, verse 12. Um, I was looking at a, one of my notes, I think, from, from Mr. Camping. And as the last caller said, uh, that word Lucifer um, would probably be, be better translated as um, I have in my margin here, boasting he is the son of mourning, uh, which would tie in with how Satan wants to take the glory of God. And he, he likes to pretend and boast that he is God. And we know, um, I also have a note here in Second Samuel 23, uh, verse 4, where, uh, speaking of God, and he shall be as the light of the morning. Uh, so uh, I think Mr. Camping, I, I know he had a very special, rare Hebrew-Greek lexicon, uh, which I think it may be virtually impossible to, uh, to get nowadays. And I think he may have been using that when... Um, he said it would be much better translated as um, how art thou falling from heaven, uh, boasting he is the son of the morning. Anyway, I just wanted to, to present that. Maybe you could check it out further. And I just took a look at uh, Strong's, and it is interesting that Lucifer is only found one time that the English translation, that word Lucifer, is only found one time, and it's in this verse. It's uh, Strong's number 1966. That's um, very closely related to Strong's 1984. I think it's the root uh, word in in the Hebrew, which means uh, boast or boasting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at that right now in the concordance and and uh it is 1966 in the hebrew um it's found that one time translated as lucifer 
And Strong says it's from 1984. Um, it's a difference in vowel pointing. And there's also a, a yoth, the, the smallest Hebrew letter that's in 1966 that's not in 1984. But you can see the connection, and it, it's translated boast, um, celebrate, and glory, and, and so forth. 1984. So it, it's it's something to um, uh, for me to to review and try to get a better grasp on. I I, I understand what's being said, but for some reason it, it just again doesn't doesn't stay with me too long. But thank you for calling and sharing. Yes, and let's thanks, go thanks, thanks. to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Uh, I seem to call a lot lately. So. <laughs> but um, the one of the prior callers had mentioned it was in Isaiah 54, 13. It says, All that are the children shall be uh, taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Uh, it's in Isaiah uh, 54, 13. I thought I'd just bring that up. It's the Lord that teaches us. Um, I'd like to say something and then uh, ask you a question at the end of this here. Uh, in Second Samuel 23, David's uh, uh, little speech here, it says that uh, thy covenant is all of my desire. So if we are looking forward to being in heaven with Christ because he has saved us wretched sinners, we really do have a blessed hope. Um, the intimidator or the impersonator, kind of like a prince. You know, there was a singer that just died whose name was Prince. And Christ is the prince of peace. And the world tries to make themselves, uh, if you will, understand or be somebody or something. Uh, but we know we, we have the true prince, Christ Jesus, who's taken us out of our sins to give us eternal life. If this is so, and we're rejoicing, looking forward now in this tribulation or this judgment time, you are doing. You've been doing a study on Cain and Abel, and and the fact that uh, we're not to, uh, as God says, judge them or or kill them during this period of time uh, where uh, Cain slew Abel and at the beginning. We at the end let God bring the judgment on Cain. Where is it that true believers might get in trouble and, and let's say, verbally kill the false Christians or something? By Would it be by bringing true doctrine, or would it be in malicious uh, or prideful way of thinking that, well, you know, I'm saved, you're, you're not? Do you get my drift? Where would well, we be killing in this time and instead of letting God do that. Uh, go ahead. I'm yeah, curious. yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Well, it, it's basically not the true believers, and I, probably not at all, that are involved in that. But what it's related to is that God uh, loosed Satan, and Satan then entered into the churches to rule completely as the man of sin. And and so a spiritual destruction began to take effect within the churches and the congregations. And and so that that was like King Nebuchadnezzar, who's a figure of Satan, coming against Judah. And then the emissaries of Satan are like the Babylonians. And so they're they're coming, they're destroying the New Testament corporate church worldwide with the tongues gospel. Uh, that's a, a something that God makes mention of because he speaks of a nation of a fierce countenance whose tongue thou understandest not that would destroy Judah. And so the tongues gospel is sort of like the language of Babylon as it is destroyed and, and just wrought incredible spiritual destruction uh, across the whole church world. And, and all uh, the other things that go along with it, the signs and wonders, the, the whole charismatic gospel. And during this time, church after church is falling. 
And during the, the Great Tribulation's 23 years, the true believers were being driven out. And it was, let's say, the Reformed community that that was not going after the tongues gospel. They were perhaps more closely identified with the elect, the true believers. They they were more like our brethren or our brothers, like Cain and Abel or Jacob and Esau, uh, because they held many of the same doctrines as true believers. The Bible, the Bible alone, you know, um, sola scriptura, and and the five points of Calvinism, even though one of those points is not correct. But but all these types of things, and and then during this awful Great Tribulation, the true believers are being driven out of the congregations, and our Reformed brethren the ones that should have known better, they're, in a sense, rejoicing that this is happening to the elect of God. Of course, they don't view us as the elect of God, but they're rejoicing that it's happening to those troublemakers, is more how they would view us, who would constantly bring up Bible points against the doctrine of the Reformers, which they held sacred, or constantly bring up things against the doctrine of the Church, which they revered, and and they did not just um, uh, enjoy and and think that that we had a wonderful pastor when when we did, according to them, but they were constantly questioning the things the pastor was teaching. And and so when they rejoiced and and they they were involved in that activity against the elect of God, well then it it all comes around and relates to what's being said in Genesis and Obadiah and other places of the Bible that God has in view. It it's um, a, a little complicated to to explain, but that's basically I think what's going on. But thank you for calling and sharing, and I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions, your comments, and especially the Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. Uh, We'll be returning to our online fellowship with more scripture reading and hymn singing, and you're welcome to just stay tuned for that. Also, please join us tonight on Facebook beginning at 8 through 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time for our online question and answer uh, group. It's called Sunday Q&A, and all are welcome to participate. You can do that by joining that group, and uh, you can leave a question or comment in the group once you join at any time. But for now, uh, we'll, we'll bring our question and answer program to a close. May you have a good afternoon and a blessed Lord's Day. And thank you for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights following the Monday through Friday studies. Check eBibleFellowship.com for the current schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done. <laughs>